Hello, I'm Mike Forward, a solicitor here in Wrigley's Charities and Social Economy team. Welcome back to the Wrigley's podcast series aimed at breaking down employee ownership and discussing why it could be the right option for your business. In our last episode, we looked at what the benefits of a transition to employee ownership are and why you might want to consider this for your company. This is the third episode where we'll be looking at the ways in which employee ownership helps to safeguard the future of a business, how it is sustainable and what impact this has on the management of the company. Employee-owned businesses, when structured and managed appropriately, are able to channel the energy, commitment and abilities of the employees into an improved culture where everyone in the business shares the all-in-this-together mentality and everyone works towards a common purpose. This can allow employee-owned businesses to weather difficult times more readily and easily than other businesses. Good governance of an employee-owned business is built upon proper communication, transparency and planning, with all employees able to see and understand where the business is going and what the key challenges may be. Use of employee councils and their employee representatives in larger businesses allow the company to consider and take advantage of additional avenues of ideas, further evidencing why the collaborative nature of an employee-owned business can have a positive impact. These avenues can channel the thoughts and initiatives of the wider employee base and provide an outlet for creative thinking that can sometimes be stifled in a more traditional corporate structure. The Employee Ownership Trust, if one is in place, can be the forum for considering not only the financial performance of the business as shareholders, but also employee engagement and whether directors are properly observing their company's act duties to have regard for the employees of the business. When structured correctly, the financial obligations related to paying the outgoing owner for their shares should not impact heavily on the business, so sustainability is a consideration from day one. The process of moving to employee ownership involves taking advice not only from solicitors like ourselves at Wrigley's, but also the company's accountants and financial advisors to ensure that the financial plans are viable to support both payments to the former owners and the continuing needs of the business. A transition to employee ownership does lead to a different structure, and there can be concerns from the existing management team as to how this will impact their ability to govern and run the company on a day-to-day basis. The practical reality is that the majority of the day-to-day responsibility for running the company and making decisions remains with the existing management. Although, of course, management may be restructured as part of the transition to employee ownership due to the wider succession planning initiatives of which the employee ownership now forms part. Where a company moves to employee ownership, it can, and often does, put in place an employee council or mechanism to take account of the views of the employees. Whether an employee council, employee representative, or a form of voting or ballot is appropriate, will largely depend on the size of the company and the number of employees. With employee councils normally being used to represent larger workforces where individual voting on key matters may be too unwieldy. When making the transition to an employee owned business, whether via the indirect, direct, or hybrid structures detailed earlier in this podcast series, the company will adopt new governing documentation, its Articles of Association, and will often put in place a more formal constitution. These new documents include updates to reflect the fact that the business is wholly or partly employee-owned and, as a result, the employees or their representatives may need to be consulted on certain key matters. There's no prescriptive form for these matters, and the list can be as extensive or as narrow as the company and the employees choose. But some common decisions which may require the input of the employees are Resolutions to wind up or dissolve the trading company or any subsidiary of the trading company. Any substantial change in the nature of the business of the company and its subsidiaries, if any, taken as a whole. Any amendment to the Articles of Association. Declaring or paying any dividend or making any distribution by way of a bonus to the employees. Any sale of the trading company and or any subsidiaries to the trading company. The provisions of a remuneration policy and taking or granting of any loans, security, or guarantee which are not in the ordinary course of business, or which may be above a particular threshold. For example, borrowings which equate to amount more than 20% of the value of the net assets of the company. This allows the directors to continue to run the company, 
but put certain material decisions, or at least the discussions surrounding them, to the company as a whole, which provides the employees with a greater level of transparency and a substantial feeling of ownership and accountability, which we believe often leads to greater productivity. Where an employee ownership trust is involved, and a corporate trustee, in the form we covered in our initial podcast in this series, is in place, the governing documentation of the corporate trustee and the terms of the trust will dovetail with the updated articles of association of the trading company to allow for seamless decision-making. The corporate trustee of the EOT will also usually have at least one of the trustee directors appointed from the employees, along with trustee directors appointed from existing or ongoing management and potentially an independent trustee. It is important to note that the individuals who are the trustee directors of the EOT will have certain duties to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries, the employees of which they may be a part, which may occasionally conflict with the duties of the directors of the underlying company. The governing documentation will set out a conflict procedure to assist with this. In order to ensure that the revised structure is sustainable and will work for the company going forward, it will be important to management to be committed to this level of greater transparency and engagement with the employees or their representatives. The same must also be said of the employees, as their engagement is just as important, and this is why we always advise that the company takes time 